everybody. It's Adam Farkas. Welcome back to another OD Wire webinar. Thanks for making it out tonight. Now, before we get started, some ground rules here. As we go on, if you have questions for the speaker on the right side of your screen, you should see a box that says questions. Feel free to open that box up and type into it. And I'll take your questions, hold them aside. Uh, and at the very end, I can verbally ask the speaker your questions. The other housekeeping thing today, I know for today's show, we had a raffle going on, a $100 gift card for five winners. Uh, I'm going to actually draw those names after the presentation is over. And if you win, you get, you'll get an email hopefully within the next day or two. So no ambiguity there. The numbers are actually drawn with a random number generator. I truly use one. I like to keep it on the up and up. And I, I of course, and the speaker are not eligible. So just to let you know. Um, anyway, so tonight uh, is all about contact lenses something we haven't done in a little while, so I'm really glad to do this today. And it's sort of how to improve the patient's experience through soft specialty contact lenses. You know, as we all know, standard contact lenses have made you know great strides over the past 30 to 40 years. But even today in 2022, there are a lot of clinical cases where the results that you have with them may be suboptimal. And the great thing is, is that there are a lot of specialty soft contact lenses that are out there right now that you can use. And tonight we're gonna to talk all about these specialty lenses and we're gonna actually speak with an expert. So tonight with us, we have Dr. Moshe Schwartz. He is one of the few and proud members in the contact lens and cornea section uh, at the Academy. I, I think there's only gotta be maybe 100 or 150 at this point. I don't remember from the last meeting, but so it's sort of an exclusive crowd of contact lens fitters. Uh, he's been at this for many years. So he's a true expert in specialty lenses and he's in private practice in Owen Mills, Maryland. And I can't think of a better person to sort of walk us through tonight to talk to us all about specialty lenses. And one sort of trivia fact that I learned from him the other day was when he was applying to optometry school way back when, um, my father, Paul, the founder of OD Wire, who's probably listening tonight, uh, actually interviewed him. And, uh, and Moshe, I hope you've recovered from that all these years <laughs> later, because I know it must have been a traumatic experience when it happened. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so with that said, uh, I'm going to give you the keyboard and mouse, and uh, why don't you take it away? All right. Uh, well, thanks for the kind words, Adam. And uh, actually, it was a pretty uh, interesting and humbling experience uh, meeting your dad, who is by all means one of the that always been in the forefront of contact lenses and optometry. So it was a very special moment for me, and he uh, was very kind. But anyhow, moving forward, uh, this talk really is. Um, even though it said specialty contact lenses, I think and I hope that as we walk through this uh, presentation, you realize that to fit a specialty type of contact lens is not that difficult and special. And it, it's rather straightforward. And let's get rolling here. Uh, these are my financial disclosures, uh, specialized, true form optics, uh, expert testimony, um, and the uh, National Football League. I can reveal teams that I'm affiliated with just due to contractual obligations. So before we're going to talk about contact lenses, we're going to speak about refraction. You know, this is a separate fee when a patient comes in and we do a refraction on them, well, if they choose to do a refraction. And we're going to uh, look at the components or different variables when we prescribe glasses. So the obvious one is the sphere, the, the, uh, the hyperope or myope. And then we're going to look into cylinder, cylindrical correction or astigmatic correction. With that goes hand in hand, the axis, which basically means the orientation of the astigmatic correction. And we specify between zero to 180 using degrees. And of course, as you know, we always specify PD. We always measure this in between the pupils. I don't know why it's acting up, okay. So for example, when you have a patient that comes in and you refract them, and that it's not unusual to have a prescription that will show minus one, minus 150. As we said, that's the cylindrical correction. And of course, the orientation. And pretty much we specify on the degree because when we have a patient that comes in for refraction, they expect to get an accurate and careful refraction that will give them the optimum vision through their prescription and the glasses. So we specify sphere, seal, and of course, the axis. We never really say, well, if it's a seven, I'm gonna give them axis 180, 
or if it's seven, I'm going to do maybe axis 10, we specify axis eight. And the same goes with the sill. If it's 150, we specify 150. We don't say one and a quarter or 175 because the patient expects us to deliver an accurate and specific refraction. So keeping that in mind, I'm going to jump back into it all the time. Let's talk about the different variables in a routine contact lens evaluation. And that basically means, what do we do, what do we do when we have a patient in a chair that comes in for an evaluation? Well, the first thing that we do is a comprehensive medical and ocular history. Not unusual, we do with everybody. Second is refraction. Again, as we talked before, we carefully evaluate the refractive error, whether it's a myo, hyperope, astigmatism, and again, to the T. Basically, we want to find out exactly where their refractive error is. Third, we, we look at the keratometric reading, topography. And of course, we look at the HVID, the horizontal visible iris diameter, and pupil size. And then we take a look at the arterial segment evaluation. Now, when you look at the, these six different components that I just specified, we do it on every single contact lens patient that comes in and asks us to be valued for a contact lens. We look at their history, refraction, K reading, HVID, anterior seg, pupil size, and whatnot. Now, the kicker is if we walk into a shelf and we pick up any random disposable type of contact lens, and it doesn't really matter which manufacturer, whether it's Alcon, Johnson & Johnson, Cooper, or BNL, it, it's irrelevant. You can already cross out line three because right off the bat, you're not really using K readings, you're using whatever you have on your shelf. So you're not looking at the base curve of the contact lens relative to the characterometric reading that your patient had, or vice versa if you use topography and whatnot. So you're really kind of limiting your approach to your patient management. So, which leads us to the next point of how do we define a successful contact lens fit? Well, we always need to remember there's two parties when we do things. We have the patients and we have our own perspective as we come to deal with contact lens. The number one that we know that can make you break will be a comfort. Now, what do we know about a comfort of contact lens? The comfort of a contact lens has different variables that could lead to it. However, what we really know that truly, if you look at the base curve, if you look at your keratometric reading, that line three that we talked about earlier, if you're not going to address it, this is the one that really will determine the comfort level that your patients will have because it's the back surface of the lens relatively to the tear film and your cornea and how all three interact together. So if you pick up a random base curve, it could affect the comfort of your patients. Another thing that we have to address and it's not as high as whenever we talk about contact lens dropouts are the acuities. And that's something really interesting. And I find very interesting, especially with my interns that rotate through my <laughs> clinic and even talking to fellow practitioners. How do we really look and define acuities? And what I'm trying to say by that, is there a difference between static and dynamic acuity? We all know, of course, the answer is yes. And I'm not talking about a wide receiver that is running like a million miles an hour to catch a ball. I'm talking about someone that goes up and about or someone that reads extensively and he has a lot of microsaccadic movements. That's more dynamic than whether they sit in your exam chair and just to check their near acuities. Another thing that often as tends to be over overlooked is the stability of the vision. You need to ask yourself how often when you check acuities of your patients, do you document the stability of the vision? And what I'm, what I'm referring to that is when a patient can come in and read you O and R, the 20-20 line easily, well, you know, the vision pretty stable and we're doing great, more, more than likely follow-up visit, 
whether it's via phone call or in office, will be pretty darn good. But when you have the hesitation when they read the letters, you know that potentially and more than likely there's some issue of stability. So when we talk about uh, stability, more specifically, we need, as soon as you get that reaction or the hesitation, the first thing you want to do is to look at the way that the lens interacts on the eye as far as movement. And of course, if it's a toric lens, you have to check for subtle rotation. And sometimes you'll find different rotation when they read versus distance. And that can be crucial, especially for people that do extensive near work, whether it's computer, reading, writing, and which most folks are doing it anyhow nowadays. So the question that we ask ourselves, okay, it sounds nice and dandy, but really, especially now with COVID, a lot of patients don't want to reintroduce the same contact lens to the eye. Do we really need to customize our patients? What's the point? Why not prescribe dailies, disposable contact lenses? Well, there's really, if you look by and large, there's nothing wrong with a daily lens. And again, it doesn't matter who is the manufacturer. However, they're not specific. So if you have a patient that has a minus one, we're gonna go back to our refraction, minus one, minus 50, X is 10. Well, if you're gonna give them their spherical equivalent, you're really not giving them the right prescription, do you? You're kind of fudging the seal, trying to overcome that small degree of astigmatism because as you probably hear it often, oh, you know, you have such a small amount of astigmatism. I don't think you really need it in your contact lenses. Perhaps they don't, but if they do need it in their contact lenses, why would you write the script in glasses? If they don't need it, they don't need it. If they need it, prescribe it. So again, you know, the ease of uh, prescribing dialysis is great. You know, it's the ease of use, cleaning, we don't expose the eye to the same object over and over again. It makes it much easier for handling. And of course, if there's any issues with, uh, with the management of the lenses. And again, is there a difference between half a diopter and 0.75? Still, one diopter and one and a quarter? Of course there is, because we specify every day, all of us, on our glasses scripts. Every time we specify, we're very specific because we want our patients to have the perfect vision, the vision that they deserve to have. So we specify. And that really go boils down to if we want to quantify the quality of the vision versus the quantity. And basically, it's very hard to determine what is the quality of the vision, but that's the patient's perception. How do they feel that their vision is? And a very good question that I like to ask patients, whether they're return patients or whether it's the first time in my office and they wear the air doc, I've been wearing my same lenses for many years, I am doing terrific. I was like, great, good. I haven't changed my lenses one time. They're great. I said, okay, well, how would you describe your vision? Yeah, you know, it's okay. I'm having some issues at night. Okay. Are you putting any drops during the day? Oh, yeah, every hour I got to put a drop in. When I come home from work, I, I can't wait to take these lenses out. But the kicker is you have the patients in your chair, happy as can be on paper, but not quite happy. However, they don't know any better. And our job as practitioners is to educate our patients and then allow them to make an education decision while they're sitting on your chair. So we all know the answer. It's every, you know, a quarter seal can make a difference. Five degrees, of course, can make a difference because that's why we specify every day, the whole day, when we write our glasses prescriptions. We never round it. So let's just jump right in and let's talk about a few cases. So a typical 31 year old contact lens dropout due, due to poor vision and comfort, he really and truly wants to go back to wearing contact lenses. His unaided acuities are reduced. He's 2200 minus in the right and the left. 
and 2100 OU. His best corrected acuities, really nothing out of the ordinary, but what we see here, we have minus two, minus two and a quarter, X is 25 in the right. And of course, slightly reduced acuity in the left because of the high seal of 375 minus at X is 175. The characterometric reading definitely correlate with uh, his astigmatism, which basically tells you we're in really good shape. Now, if you look at the 2030 and you want to dive deeper, into it, well, of course, they reduce security because the odds are more than likely for many years he hasn't been fully corrected in his contact lenses, and as, as a result, he manifests itself himself as amblyopic in the left eye. But wait, it gets better. Remember, part of the items that we look when we evaluate a patient is the HVID, the horizontal visible iris diameter. Is 12.31. Okay, so what does it actually tell us when we have HVID? It's basically described the sagittal height of the cornea. So you have to remember the larger the cornea diameter, the steeper, the, the larger the sagittal height, basically the steeper the reading are, versus the smaller it is, the flatter it is. So what we're actually seeing here is not truly the true characterometric reading that this patient has, number one. Number two, what it tells us, well, if he wears any type of uh, disposable lens, which we're gonna go through the whole gamut, which one will work? When you have such a, a larger diameter cornea, the odds of contact lens stability are slim to none just because of lens rotation. And consequently will affect vision, comfort, and the, the end result is that you have a patient that dropped out of contact lenses because they never really worked for him. They never, they were not comfortable and they were not pleased with their acuity. So let's take a look at the corneal topography. Really, really and truly straightforward, all central, nothing that really jumps out of, that, that tells something is uh, irregular. All right, let's move forward. So, Let's go through the option list, okay? You know, remember when you walk into Starbucks and you want to order a cup of coffee, you have over 87,000 options. Yet, when we have a patient come into our office for correct lens in this particular case, are we only going to limit them to four? It doesn't make sense. So, if we go and look at different month monthly replacement modalities, so we have ultra for astigmatism, and we're not, I'm not here to discuss which lens is better, what benefits. I'm here to discuss what does a patient need and how can we meet their visual demands. We're now going to break down advantages, disadvantage of ultra versus Cooper. That's not what this conversation is all about. This conversation is about patient care and enhancing their experience in contact lenses. So when we look at the ultra for astigmatism, Again, axis. Do we go with 20 in a right eye? Do we go with 30? I mean, it's only 25. So, I mean, which way will work better for us? It's not quite scientific when you try to guesstimate the axis, while when you write the prescription in your refraction, you're very specific. You meaning us, we're all specific. Now, interesting enough, if you look at their left eye, you can only go up to minus 275. Again, the issue of axis. Do we go with 170 or do we go with 180? Well, we can always add half a diopter, a spherical equivalent, because our patient has minus 375 seal. But then again, will they be, ha will they be happy with this acuity that we're going to provide them with these contact lenses? Well, let's jump and let's look at the AccuV Oasis for Symmetim or Ov Vita. Again, the same exact deal. You know what's really interesting too? One base curve and one diameter. You don't have the flexibility if you have a steeper cornea to play with a base curve. You don't have the luxury. Well, I have a large HVID. I need to increase the overall diameter for this patient. It's everything is being dictated for, dictated for us. One size fits everybody. And we know it can be the case because we can have 
the same exact refraction, the same exact topography on 11.5 HVID, and the lenses are now going to look at all identical when you compare both patients. So things got to be more specific for our patients to enjoy their experience. Well, let's look at Biofinity Toric. The same thing, okay? We're trying to guesstimate the axis, 20, 30, 170, or 180, again, spherical equivalent. However, de definitely we can use the Biofinity Toric. Why is it going now? Uh, by Cooper Vision, good option, no doubt about it. However, we can definitely address the refractive error with a seal, no doubt, axis, absolutely. However, what about the base curve? And what about the diameter? We are restricted. And that's a problem, especially with the larger HBID. And as the same goes with uh, air optics for astigmatism, Again, X is 20 or 30, we do spherical equivalents. So my patient was highly motivated and I want, to, I want to be able to provide them with the best care. So here's what I did. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> um, base curve in the right eye was 8.2, diameter is 15.0. That was the prescription. Minus two, minus two X is 25. In the left eye, we did 8, 3, 15, 1. Minus 1 and a quarter, minus 350, X is 175. Acuities were 20, 20 in the right, 20, 25 plus in the left, and 20, 20 plus two stable acuities. So one might say, wait a minute, left eye, you still didn't get into 2020. True, absolutely true. However, don't forget where we started. We started at 2030. And this patient, if you would follow them up in about six to eight weeks, don't be surprised that their acuity will improve to 2020 without any vision therapy, without any occlusion therapy, without anything, just by allowing the eye to have a, a stimulation to see well. So this is a kind of a neat um, video that I found on YouTube. And I, hopefully it's going to work for me. And that's a blink of an eye. If you can please... Um, Take a look at it. It's it's really, really interesting because it shows how the human eye actually blinks. So we see how it goes in, but look when it retracts. Wait a minute. Whoops. Sometimes we tend to forget that the upper lid goes in. It's a scissor motion. So imagine that upper lid grabs that lens and starts to rotate it. If you have a toric lens that doesn't fit properly, well, guess what? These are the people that have that transient blur. These are the type of patients that come to you and they say, and they have their hands in their eyes because every so on, they have to reposition the lens in their eye. And we don't want that. So let's look at the, another case. Uh, that was actually kind of interesting. Happened a couple of years ago uh, after an incident on the field. Uh, one of the players was referred to my clinic for emergency visit. Um, it was a head to head, uh, helmet to helmet. And after he was hit, he was sitting there. He was um, dazed and confused. The concern was that, um, of course, concussion. They whisked him to the, the tent for concussion protocol, and he scored higher than preseason. And yet he's still sitting on the side, a little bit confused, blinking, something doesn't add up. So ocular history, he wears a soft daily uh, contact lenses, reduced acuity, and he was wearing soft uh, daily, okay? Uh, 2600 in the right, 2600 in the left, and 2600 OU. Interestingly enough, uh, best corrected acuity, again, we wanna give our patients the best, minus 575, Minus 75 X is 14 in the right. And the left eye was minus one, uh, 550 minus 50 X is 168. 
So far, so good, right? So we refract the right, perfect. Refract the left, great. We open both wells. All right, what's the acuities now? And you know that second when you open both wells and, and the patient head rests against the foropter and they give you that hesitation and slight pullback? You know that something is going on as far as their binocularity. And he says, yeah, I'm seeing, but it's kind of moving on me and it's kind of doublish. So lo and behold, he had a vertical deviation of two base down in the left eye. Consequently, when he, during uh, the impact, he couldn't fuse and he was seen too. And he was trying to fuse and that's why he appeared to be um, dazed and confused. <clears throat> Again, if you look at the coronal topography, pretty straightforward, nothing that will jump at you, some, nothing will tell you we have some major issues. So the question that we have to ask ourselves, well, you have your patient, this patient in your chair, what will you do? How will you address their visual demands and visual needs? What would, how would you manage it? I mean, would you prescribe sports goggles? I mean, he has vertical deviation. What do you do? And then you ask yourself, which disposable contact lens will work? So maybe if we'll blur him up a little bit like he was before, he's not gonna be as sensitive to the double or the deviation, because we all know that sometimes blur can, uh, can uh, the double vision sometimes can mask itself with, with the blur vision. So once we get our patient to see very clearly, all of a sudden double vision arises. So maybe we'll blur him up again, but these patients want to see very well. So let's look again at the options. We look at the monthly replacement modalities. Well, again, he had access 14 in, in a right eye. Well, do we give him 10, do we give him 20? In the left eye, he had only half a diopters of astigmatism. So do we go with spherical equivalent? Do we jack it up by a quarter? Or maybe we over minus him by a quarter with our seal correction. Again, goes with the same with Acuvue Oasis and Acuvue Oasis for astigmatism. Again, we can prescribe what our patients need. We can guesstimate the axis and we can guesstimate the power by using spherical equivalence or we over minus them, which we don't want to do anyhow. And the same goes with Bioaffinity or Bioaffinity Toric by Cooper. So let's say we did that, fine. They kind of like it, everybody's happy. What are you gonna do about the prison base down? How would you address them? I mean, they need it, right? So you give them sports goggles over the contact lens. I mean, where do we go with that? And that's something that you need to think because in this particular case, the patient was, uh, a player in the National Football in, uh, League, but we have it with patients anyhow that have vertical deviations, that do want to wear our contact lenses. How do we help them? So I use the specialized toric 59%, um, and it's very simple. 8, 4, 14, 2, minus 5, 15, minus 75. And yes, X is 14. I specified to the degree because I can, and luckily for me, they can manufacture it for me with one and a half base down for stability. And in the left eye, A2, 14, 2, minus five and a quarter. And yes, I prescribe the half a diopter because I do prescribe it in my glasses prescription. And I will, of course, prescribe it in my contact lens prescription because I want my patients to be able to see clearly. And yes, with one on the axis of 168, however, using two and a half diopter base down. Acuities were 2015 in the right, 2015 in the left. But more importantly, everybody wonders probably what was OU, and it was 2015 plus. In, to his particular uh, position, uh, uh, we had a conversation and he wanted a little bit tint 
who liked the yellow. Um, I don't know if you guys pro you probably remember the Maguire uh, tint. Uh, we did some modification to it in our clinic uh, because it helps with the contrast. And, and these are really subtle tint because most of them don't want to walk around with red or orange lenses. And these are the anterior segment uh, images. And I'm going to share with you here, hopefully you'll appreciate, uh, we did anterior segment videography. And what hopefully you can see the stability of the lens on the eye, lack of mo minimal movement on primary gaze, no rotation. And that's what we expect from every lens to interact on arterial film and cornea, because if there's minimal movement and rotation, you know that there's be good stability of vision. You know your patients will be very happy with the comfort end of vision. So moving forward to case number three. Um, a 40-year-old male present with reduced vision at near with the soft disposable contact lenses. His best corrective acuity is in the right eye minus a quarter, minus two and a quarter, excess 100. Uh, in the left hand, minus 150, minus 150, axis 68, with a plus one. So really nothing out of the ordinary, nothing special. But we're talking about astigmatism, we're talking about presbyopia, okay? And so we have a bunch of things that we have to be addressing when we prescribe these contact lenses to our patients. So let's talk about the options. We can always try monthly replacement modalities. BNA ultra multifocal for astigmatism. They have the parameter in the right eye, but again, one base curve, one diameter. Basically, the K reading that you did are irrelevant because you can't really dictate the base curve. HVID, irrelevant because you can't dictate HVID. Left eye, again. Do we do X is 60, we work with 70, which one will work better for us? And here's where it becomes challenging for us as practitioner, if we guess the 60, or if we go with a 70, sometimes it's chair time because they're gonna come back and well, it's not quite clear. And their low ed is around 150. Interestingly enough, if you're trying to dive deeper into what is uh, uh, the ad power when you look at, uh, uh, as far as diameter, it will be very difficult to, for you to find because it's proprietary sheet, but we know it's around 2.2 to 2.4, depends on the manufacturer. Again, if you look at Biofinity Torque uh, multifocals, same base curve, diameter, again, the same issue with the orientation of your uh, asthmatic correction. The nice thing about Biofinity Torque, you know, you can do play with a near center or distance sensor, which is very valuable for us as well. But what I did, I assumed that one seat size fits all, and I made this mistake. So, historically, what worked for most of my presbyopic patients was using 2.2 near center. So what I did was I did specify, you know, I went to, I, I was particular about the, the base curve and the diameter, and of course the seal and the orientation and the ad. However, I made a mistake and I said, well, you know what, he's young, 40, 2.2 works like a charm, okay? And he comes in, oh, okay, he comes in and his acuities are reduced. 2020 minus two at distance and not quite stable. And the same in the left eye, but distance is okay. Interestingly enough, his near is anything but okay. Okay. So if we use the disposable contact lens, okay, you know, any, any type of monthly uh, toric presbyopic lens, and you had a patient that comes in and had these symptoms, you know, the acuity is not stable at distance, the near is reduced. Well, the options that we have are we can change distance center to near center, or perhaps we should increase the ad power. Well, not quite. 
what I decided to do is I realized I, I realized that I slacked and I jumped one step in my prescribing protocol. So I'm going to change, I changed the near and peripheral zone diameters, okay? So we went to 2.4 near center and 4.5 peripheral zone, okay? Acuities were great, right, left, no problem. Both eyes, which we always check at the end, 2025. So I'm saying, what, what can possibly cause the reduced security by an ocular? Again, if you had a disposable contact lens that you fitted this patient, what would be your options? How could you troubleshoot when one eye sees 2020, the other eye sees 2020, but both eyes are not seen well? You really limited in your troubleshooting. And sometimes, and we hear it all the time from patients that comes from different practices. Well, guess what? It's pretty darn good, 2020, but with, with all the tools that we have today, that's as good as it gets. But is it really? So I said to him, you know, don't worry. Let's run with it for about a week. Let me, let me see you back in a week. Because sometimes, you know, it takes a minute for the, set, for the lenses to settle on the patient eye, as we all know. So he comes back for follow-up. Doc, my eyes are not working well together and things are floating. And I said, oh, goodness, where did I go wrong now? Well, you know when not working well, you have to really go back to your cover tests and four years and figure out what did we miss in the process. And a vertical deviation was determined using associated four years. So, again, if you didn't have the ability to, to customize and add vertical prism in a contact lens, what would you do? Would you prescribe glasses maybe for night driving with a little bit of prism? Or what about when they're on the computer? What about all around their experience and sensation wearing these contact lenses? They will not be happy or impressed. So we increased the, <clears throat> I'm increasing the right eye to 1.75 diopters based down prism. And lo and behold, it did the trick for us. And it worked very well. So I want to touch a little bit about press biopia. We need to remember when we look at the real estate, when we look at the pupil, the near, intermediate, and distance power zones must reside within the space designated by the pupil. In either distance center lens or near center lens, the surrounding powers always have negative effect on the visual outcome, reducing contrast sensitivity. Hence why we always educate our patients about simultaneous vision because simultaneously you're going to look through your near distance and intermediate powers at the same go and that will and that will affect your uh the quality of your vision or the way that one perceives their vision to be so we have to remember as the power of the surround increases the effect is magnified and Here's the thing, if we don't know the pupil diameter and lens parameter, how can you trouble a patient? So if you have a patient, for example, that is 68 with a 2.5 tiny pupils, well, if you're gonna to try to fit them with a 2.4 near center, might as well fit them in monovision because all the power goes right in front of them. They won't be able to see through, they won't have any benefit of intermediate or distance. So you have to remember, this is a crucial step that at times we tend to overlook the size of the pupil. Because once you know the size of the pupil, based on that, you can address the prescription that you want to incorporate inside the pupil. So for example, if a patient has a 4.0 uh, pupil under photopic condition and the lens is design incorporates 2.2 millimeter near a uh, center zone so you know that you have 1.8 millimeter left for distance zone 
So if you want to improve the near vision, the only alternative is to increase the space of the near zone to 2.5, leaving 1.5 for distance. So if, when, if this patient comes to you and tells you, hey, doc, listen, I'm having issue with my reading. Well, if you're going to increase their near prescription, increase the ad, all you do is you reduce the working distance. You do, you do not touch the, the, the quality of the vision. So you have to go back and look at the pupil diameter and to realize, can I increase, and to what extent can I increase the near zone to improve their near acuity? And vice versa is with distance. So patients with small pupils require smaller optical center zone size in order to incorporate the surrounding. And these patients tend to perform better with distance center optics. Using smaller center optic zones uh, will minimize the visual deterioration from spherical aberration while improving extended depth of field. And this is really interesting because about a year ago or so, Dr. Rob Davis um, and myself did a, a survey to all the members that are in the cornea and contact lens section at the American Academy of Optometry. Uh, we were trying to kind of take a deeper look into multifocal and to see what are the trends and how everybody is doing. And, and we all know there was tremendous advancement in the design. However, interestingly enough, the success rate is still questionable with only 62.7% of practitioners reporting that they have success rate of 70% transitioning patients from single vision to multifocal design. And that's quite interesting and alarming statistic because we do have the capability to feed into the manufacturing process better data, and yet we fail to do it with our patients. So let's look at another case. So a 40 year old present for contact lens evaluation with a chief complaint of reduced acuity and near. And their complaint was I could never really and truly wear contact lenses I always wanted, but they never really worked for me. And that's the prescription. In the right eye plus 650 minus one X is 178. In the left plus six minus one and a quarter X is 163 with a 2020 and a plus one and a quarter at keratometric readings very normal perhaps a little more central uh, astigmatism in the left and the right hvid definitely within normal so why will this patient have issues or difficulties wearing contact lenses well let's look at the options we can all we can do the bnl uh, ultra multifocal for astigmatism again Axis. Do we do 160? Do we do 170? Add in the left eye. And the low end is around 150 diopters. And the patient's needs one and a quarter. Biofinity toric multifocal, the same thing. However, our patient has one and a quarter. So do we prescribe one or 150? Or do we do perhaps modify monovision? Is non dominant giving? 150 dominant, give him one. Again, now we're starting to fudge the results to fit, to use what we have on the shelf to match our patient prescription. And that's not quite right. That's not why our patients come to see us. They want a solution. They want you to find a lens that will meet their visual demands and match the corneal anatomy and physiology. So what we opted to do was in the right eye, 8614 8. Uh, again, we specified everything to 178 with one and a quarter add in the right and the left. Acuities, great. But wait a minute, not everything is perfect. Near was J3 blurry and not stable. So you got to wonder well, where, where did I go wrong, right? I mean, obviously I made a mistake somewhere in the prescribing process and because the patient is here for multifocal lens design and yet I'm not meeting the near the. But if you look at the specification, 
of the lens. The near center in the right eye was 1.8 with intermediate zone 3.0. In the left, the near center is 1.8 with intermediate zone 3.0, okay? Now, the distance is great. We're only having difficulties with our near. I'm having difficulties with this moving. <laughs> So how can we improve the near vision of a patient? Well, let's increase the ad power, right? From 150, maybe to 150 or plus two. But remember what we said earlier, if you add, increase the ad power, all you're doing is playing with the, with the working distance. You're not going to improve the quality of their vision. So we have to remember that we have to get out of the mindset, oh, the plus one didn't work, let's increase it to, one plus, uh, to plus 150. We need to figure out why the plus one didn't work because their prescription is plus one, not plus 150 or not plus two. So again, increasing ad power will not improve near acuity, but reduce their working distance. So what I've done, I changed the near zone only. I increased it. And yes, if you look at, at what I've done, I did do a slight modify monovision. Guilty. But you know what? Sometimes we have to do it. So shifting the near center diameter from 1.8 to 2.0 in the right, shifting the near center in the left from 1.8 to 2.2. Again, if we're going to make a change, if we're going to make a, a, a modification, make it count. Don't go from 1.8 to 1.9. Make a nice jump. And doing that solved the problem for our patient. Now, these this type of patients you, we get in our clinic every day and you get in your clinic the same daily. And they want our help. They want a solution to the visual to the vision problems. So we have a 46-year-old female that has reduced uh, acuity, a distance and near with a soft disposable contact lenses. Best corrected acuity is in the right, minus 1350, minus 75, minus 85 in the right, minus 13, minus one, excess 100 in the left with a 175 ed. everything else within normal. So what are the options? Okay, let's go through the gamut quickly. Uh, well, the problem that we, when we look at monthly replacement modalities, when it comes to high myopia, that not all of them actually can help or address it. Crocly multifocal toric by Cooper. Again, you have two options of base curve, which is helpful. However, you have only one diameter, okay? And again, you can't specify the axis. It's got an 80 or it's 90. Um, this patient, if you really, uh, uh, vertex is between 11 and 11.5 and the ad power is it 150 or is it two? So it's not very specific. And the same goes, uh, I apologize, I didn't mean to fly, with air optics aqua multifocal. They can only go up to minus 10. Our patient is at minus 1350 before we vertexed it. So what we did was, and that, that's the nice thing about uh, customizing things. You are the doctor, you are the prescriber. You determine and you dictate exactly every parameter of your, for your patient because that's why they come to us because they want the doctor to prescribe. They don't want you to be forced to prescribe from your shelf. So in the right, it's minus 1137, minus 75, excess 83, with a near center of uh, 2.0 in the right and the left. All right, but here we go. In the right, I'm minus 2020 minus not stable. In the left eye, 2020 not stable, and guess what? J3 and near not stable. 
So the passion is, ex was excited to begin with, yes, I'm getting something special, customized, made for me, but you set the bar high. There's, as we talked about, I think the first or second slide about patient expectation. And all of a sudden we need to be able to deliver. However, we need to be able to set the expectations in a way that they have to realize it's not going to be perfect either, but close to it. So take two. So when we talked about lens stability, there's a, a typo here with the power. All I did was I changed the diameter of the lens, increased it, okay? Because there was a little bit too much lens rotation. And consequently, only changing lens diameter solved acuities, distance area. And that's something that we have to remember. If the lens moves, if the lens rotate, it will affect their vision. Now let's take another look at sports vision. A uh, 22 year old professional football player has reduced security with his frequently replacement soft contact lens prescribed for hyperopia. He's currently wearing plus 450 disposable lenses that were never right. His visual acuity with his lenses, 2050 on the right, 2060 on the left, his refraction was plus five minus 75 x is 175 in the right and plus 550 minus one x is 32 in the left. So looking at that, it's not a big deal. We can do very well with toric lenses, right? And be monthly disposables. But here's the thing, HVID 12.2. So we have to remember when this patient blinks, and remember that video with the scissor motion, the lens will rotate on the eye. When the lens will rotate on the eye, especially when you wear a toric lens, you're gonna have that transient blur. If you're playing in a certain position that you can't have that transient blur, this patient will say, well, I want my daily lenses, my spherical. I don't want anything fancy. So, how would you approach it? Which contact lens will you use? So again, if we're gonna run through all the gamut of lenses, one thing that will jump to you is A, again, we can't specify the orientation of their astigmatic correction. We, got, we have to guesstimate. But more importantly, is the diameter of the lens. So if you have a 12.3 HVID, the rule of thumb is simple. You want to have 1.5 millimeter on each side of the cornea to achieve good lens stability. So it's a simple math. So if you have 12, diameter should be 15 because 12 plus 1.5 plus 1.5 is 15. And that's what you want to do. HVID plus three, that should be your overall diameter of the lens. And the same goes with the rest of these lenses. Again, not saying that they're not a good lenses, but the problem that we have with these lenses, we can dictate the diameter of the lens and we can dictate the orientation of the astigmatic correction. So we know right off the bat that none of these lens designs will work. None of them will, will allow the patient to see well. And the kicker is we need to know before we put the lens on the eye, what to anticipate. So then you know, okay, I'll have over refraction. So if you take a spherical lens and you put, uh, uh, and you put it on a lens that has half adopters of astigmatism, you know that your over refraction will have some level of astigmatic correction. So addressing everything, that's the parameters went to overall diameter. And, and that's the greatest thing, you know, I can, get, I can prescribe anything I want. You can prescribe any parameter. You can dictate, you are the doctor. And acuity is 2020, stable. I was a little disappointed that I couldn't get to 2015, but can't always get what you want. Lenses were tinted to enhance his vision in position with amber co color. That's another thing, you know, um, he, and he loved it. Um, it's, and that's a whole different topic. Each position requires, you know, has different visual demands and 
contrast and so on and so forth. So that these were his lenses. Okay. Adam, how am I doing on time? I'm not, okay. Getting to the end here. Um, we probably right. only have about another five more minutes. Okay. So I'm going, uh, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to fly through another couple of cases because I think you're going to enjoy it. I hope you will enjoy it anyhow. So that's another patient, uh, uh, 39 year old with, with due securities with her disposable contact lenses. Nothing truly out of the ordinary. HBID is fine. Best corrected acuity. So we have one uh, diopters of astigmatism in the right, 0.75 in the left. Again, you can guesstimate, and, 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 I, and I hate to repeat myself when I say about guesstimate because these got to be specific for our patients. It can be 80 or 90, or maybe perhaps this or perhaps that. Um, I'm gonna go back to it in a second, but I figured out I'm gonna to touch this one because we all get at times in our office, our patients that are into shooting. And this particular uh, gentleman was referred to me uh, from the team and he's a 60 year old professional archer reports uh, poor vision while competing. Uh, he had uh, uh, previously worn a soft mass produced contact lenses. And that's really interesting because that gets to the nitty gritty of how do we approach Patients like that, uh, folks that uh, deal with archers or shooters, they know you know that they're very, very, very particular, as they should be. Like we all of us are, extremely particular. And he has a, a half adapters of seal in the right, and no specialist won't be able to make you uh, half adapter, but we can address it differently. And he has a half adapter of seal in the left. So when we have uh, shooters. Two challenges that we always uh, uh, we need to ask him is a do you shoot with one eye or do you shoot with both eyes open because that will dictate to you as far as the feeding guide which eye will be more dominant is he a righty is he a lefty environment do they shoot indoors do they shoot outdoors do they hunt because most of the archers usually hunt because that will help you to dictate uh, uh, certain tints that will enhance the contrast when they're out and about especially if they're professional, which goes down to the level of illumination. So this particular gentleman was actually uh, competes indoors and outdoors after different lighting conditions. So what would you do? Well, you can prescribe glasses with tints, contact lenses, you can do daily, you can do bi-weekly, you can do GPs. Again, so if, you, if we're going to run quick through all the different type of disposable that are there for us, there's nothing specific for us because he has a half adapter of astigmatism in his left eye. So you don't want to over minus him. And not only that you don't want to over minus him, you don't want to guess which orientation the seal will be, whether it's going to be 60, whether it's going to be 70. Is it going to be high ed or do we just give him a spherical equivalent? They're critical observer. They want to see very, very well. So the contact lens parameter that I ordered were minus 362 in the right and minus three and a quarter, minus 50, 66 in the left. Uh, the ad was plus one in near center design with a 2.4 central zone diameter and 3.7 intermediate zone diameter in his right eye because that's the eye that he was shooting with, okay? Aiming with, pardon me. And what we did was we customized a soft lens tinted uh, using a 3.5 central yellow tint to en enhance contrast sensitivity for indoor shooting and similar with amber for outdoor shooting. So this individual Dean one, um, his fellow compared to see that he has this fancy, uh, lenses and best corrected acuities were 2015 in the right and actually 2010 minus two OU. And, and I don't know if you can appreciate, it's a really subtle yellow thing centrally over the, uh, the pupil. And then he sends me this picture. Now, for those of you that 
understand archery, well, God bless you. I looked at it, I have no idea what he sent me, but he said, apparently it's pretty darn good. So, I mean, as of today, I don't quite sure what it means. Um, so, in essence, why do I uh, enjoy to work with Specialized? Um, I like the predicted turnaround, three to five working days. If it's something urgent, they can get it to you in a couple of days because they want to build a relationship with us. And diagnostic and supply lenses are covered 100% by warranty against staring defects. So, th so those of us, and I didn't touch and I do apologize. You know, I had a few cases for the management of myopia. You know, again, we are very limited using uh, uh, soft multifocal designs for the management of myopia. Here, you can really dictate the, the near center, distant center, uh, how small, how big, how large, the seal correction, everything. And as we know, we want to make sure we have stability of vision and you can control it with lens diameter and the base curve. And you can order the lenses anytime online, if, even after you finish your clinic hours. And one thing that is somewhat important, but not crucially important, you know, the 1-800s of the world become non-factors because they can order it from your practices only. So when we have patients that, you know, do, do the fitting with us and they ask for prescription, of course, we give them prescription right away, but it's very specific for a specific lens because it's a customized lens and they can't get it anywhere else unless they call uh, uh, our colleagues that work with Specialized, but they can go to 1-800. And one of the nice things about it, it does create excitement in your patients. You have patients that dropped out of, uh, uh, contact lenses because they couldn't wear lenses and uh, it, it's definitely it's not that difficult uh, to fit these lenses because it's really all the parameters and all the measurements that you'd normally take for any type of lenses regardless so why not use the data that you collected as a clinician and transfer it to a diagnostician you diagnose your patient and you write what's in the best interest for the patient Another great thing that I love about, sometimes I will have lens rotation. And even with, with, with Specialized, I don't have to, you know, I could never figure out that left add, right subtract. I mean, I figure out, but then you got to guesstimate to what extent, degrees, rotate the slit lamp. All you have to do here is you change them out of prisms. You change the diameter. You improve. You All of a sudden, the lens rotation is not factor. Same goes with pu pupil size in multifocal. You know, if you have a patient with you do security at near, if you wear, if you use only uh, disposable type of lenses, you're very limited in in your troubleshooting ability, and which is quite frustrating. So, incorporating a subspecialty vision. Uh, the vision within our practice for sports vision opens the door to new opportunities and growth and add excitement. But you know what? You, you can fit these lenses with, and we have a lot of kids playing uh, lacrosse in high school. We have baseball players in college. It, it doesn't necessarily it has to be reserved for uh, professional teams because we have a lot of uh, weekend uh, warriors that want to be able to see better and to enjoy the eyesight and the contact lens prescription and vision, and we're now in a position that we can really and truly give it to them. And I'm done. Adam? All right. Well, well, Dr. Schwartz, thank you for that. Um, really great cases. And I know that we, we have a limited amount of time tonight for questions, but no matter what happens, we're going to have uh, this archived on OD Wire, and you can come back to there and ask questions and type them in and we can have the conversation continue there. But if anybody has any questions right now, feel free to type them in the question box and I'll just you know, quickly ask you a couple of them uh, before we log out for the night. So you, know, you showed us a bunch of good cases and people have, have questions as we were going. Um, the first question I think that people have is cost uh, of the lens. Obviously, if you're in the NFL, it doesn't matter. <laughs> but for a regular patient, um, <laughs> sort <does>. of... <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so how do you actually talk to patients about that, about the cost and the benefit versus the cost? Uh, you know, I, I think that uh, uh, the cost to practitioner, um, I, I'm not quite sure. Maybe uh, Corrine or Brianna will be able to answer that. 
but if I may, um, I'm, I'm going to give you a really poor analogy of coffee. Okay, you can go to the local diner, get a cup of coffee for 99 cents or maybe a dollar fifty, and next door they have Starbucks. It sells you the same coffee, maybe with almond milk and whatever for five bucks, and yet you have a line through the door to Starbucks. Why? Because they have the ability to customize. They give you 80, more than 87,000 different options for how to make your coffee. So I'm not trying to be dismissive and I apologize if I come across like that because that's not my intention by all means. But when you explain to your patients his condition, which basically means their astigmatism, the orientation, and they have to understand one simple thing. One size can't fit all. Because if there's one size that fits everything, it's not going to be a, uh, you're going to have one type of contact lens and that's it. So when you create this excitement, all of a sudden, everything is about the care that we deliver to our patients. And I know it sounds very naive. It's not about fees. It's about the care. And once our patients uh, understand and believe, and it's it, it's really and truly is about care because we want to provide the best possible care to our patients, all of us. And when you tell them, you know, you're here because you want, you know, I'm going to give you the best. Consequently, in many cases, and I can't even tell you in my case, it's 100%, the fees become secondary. Now, I'm not trying to dance around the answer. Um, if uh, anybody from Specialized is, 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 yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So um, our Toric contact lenses, um, the most popular 54 and 59 Torics are 33 lens, and then the multifocal and multifocal Torics are, um, excuse me, 49.50 a lens. Um, so, you know, and they are uh, replaced on a quarterly basis. You're welcome to re replace them more frequently if you choose to. Um, the cost per lens right now is the same and hopefully in the future we'll offer a monthly lens option for you as well. Um, yeah, absolutely. So, so uh, and we usually recommend one and a half to two times the lens cost, but certainly we empower practitioners to set their pricing as they see fit based on the case and the complexity and um, your demographic. So, you know, if, so in a nutshell, if you compare this, the cost, okay, for your supply of um, uh, one of the, I'm not going to mention them because I don't, I don't want anybody to think that I'm biased against one company or another, which is not the case. But if you compare the cost of a multifocal toric soft disposable lens versus a year supply from Specialized, I think you'll find very close to be the same. And I could be wrong. Am I wrong, Corinne, or am I kind of close? No, no, you're absolutely right. That's, um, you know, that's part of how we want to empower the practitioners and really support the practice is we want to be able to keep those profits in your practice and, you know, make it affordable for both you and for the patients. So um, absolutely, it, we it's um, certainly a, a little bit of a cost difference, but not substantial to where the quality of customization features should be a barrier. I would agree with you. And, and, and now another interesting thing, and, and it happens to all of us, you have a patient, you get them all fired up, everybody's excited about going to customize and they order it, they get the lens and the novelty wears off. And they say, oh, you know what, yeah, I don't want it. it happens all the time. What I, I do appreciate about working with specialized, all we, you have to, we do is we come say, hey, listen, uh, our patient changed their mind, they don't want it. You don't even have to send the lenses back and they just credit it which I think it's insane, but we love it. And the same when you, we train patients, you know, sometimes they will tear a lens, especially with kids. And uh, with pediatric patients, all you have to do, we call and they send a free replacement, which for me, it's extremely valuable. Yeah, absolutely. And thanks so much for that, Dr. Schwartz. We really do um, try to form our policies around supporting the practitioners, making their life super easy. Um, to Dr. Schwartz's point, yeah, all of our lenses come with a warranty for the full life of the lens for the trial and the supply. So if anything happens to the lens during that time, we'll take care of it for you. Simply just give us a call, let us know what happened, and um, we'll we'll take care of you on our end. And uh, Corinne, actually, you know, you sort of brought it up, but I'll, I'll ask Dr. Schwartz as well. Um, you know, you mentioned the trials. How many times, how many trials do you usually go through with a patient before you get it right? Uh, well, 
Let, let's break it down to toric versus multifocal. Uh, we've been very lucky, or, 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 but we, we tend to, you know, it's one of the things you measure twice and you cut once. Uh, it's all about collecting good data, which we all can do the same way. Um, with the Torix, really, on a rare occasion, we have redos on a, on a, on, on a single vision Torix. Um, of course, as the, uh, the cases here showed you, I'm far from being perfect. And some uh, with multifocals, it, you can have a couple of redos, but that's it. I mean, maybe two. At times three, if it's a more advanced case, if you have to incorporate prisms and things like that, with again, we lack in our data collection. But normally, not more than two follow-ups. Yeah, absolutely, um, and that, and our data points to that as well. Um, you know, we most of our toric contact lenses are successful in one to two lens fittings, and the majority of our multifocals are in one to three. So. Um, that lines right up with what we've seen from a success data standpoint um, over the last few years. All right, and we have time for one more question, but this is a good one, so I want to get it in here. Um, the question is, do you ever typically start with standard soft lenses and then move into custom as needed? Do you have certain parameters that you think about where you might go straight to custom lenses and not even go with standard lenses? That's a great question, and, and, and I appreciate it. Uh, in my practice, no, never. My, my approach is very simple. If I was sitting on the chair, if I was the patient, and it was the other way around, how would I like my doctor to try to approach the management of my vision? I would, I'm very particular. I'm a critical observer. I want to see very well. I would want my, my doctor to give me the best. And if we develop this report with the patient and in, in my clinical setting, you know, we have uh, two different topographers that we use. We have screens that show the topography and we sit down and we explain to the patients, you know, this is your eye. This is your fingerprint. Only you have it. You know, you can't have a six foot guy and tell him that he has to wear a 31 waist. It could be six foot guy, uh, 160 pounds. It can be a six foot guy wearing uh, 400 pounds. One size can fit every everything, especially when it comes to toric correction, because we do have the lens rotation. And we talk about, it. and we say, hey, how often do you have to really reposition the lens in your eye? Oh, it happens all the time. So guess what? If it happened with company A, it will happen, happen with company B, C, and D. If I go in to say, you know what? I have a good lens for new design, new material, blah, blah, blah. Let's try it. Well, guess what I just did? Wasted chair time. Because if nothing worked before, nothing like that will work again. And for us, all of us doctors, you know, chair time is crucial. So we have to be very mindful. And if they have the half adapter of astigmatism, believe you me, they would love it. Just like they love it in the glasses correction. You know, I dare any, any, any practitioner instead of the minus four, minus 50 excess two to prescribe minus four and a quarter for their glasses. Nobody will do that. So why go into it with contact lens? Because you know you're heading into redos, visits, and at the end, you're gonna end up where you should have started with approaching it from a customized point of view. Now, I can't tell you that every patient that I talk to say, okay, sure, doc, let, let's go with it. I have patients that say, no, I don't want to do it for whatever the reasons are, and I respect it. You know, my job as a doctor is to educate and empower my patient. Then when, once they make a decision, at least they know that they're not going to come and tell me, hey, I'm not seeing that great. And I say, oh, yeah, I know, because we're not correcting your astigmatism. We talked about it. I showed you. And I, I do like to, to demonstrate through the foropter, you know, even the half adopter said, hey, that's your vision when you properly correct it. Let me show you what happened when I take the, the asymmetric correction out. That's how your vision will be. And that's only with the, that's just the glasses. Imagine how it will be with contact lenses. Vision is subjective. Once they, they get it and they appreciate, the odds are, that they will uh, choose to go with 
with your recommendation. But but basically, to, to answer the question um, from the get go, uh, if I introduce the patient to the best solution that I believe and I know will meet their visual demands. And if I know that they have some seal that I'm not addressing, I know that they're not going to be happy with me. So yep. I, I go in, I, I, so I present all options. I said, listen, we can do the disposable lenses, option one, but you're not going to correct your symmetry. We can do the customized lens. It's a three months lens. Every quarter you replace it, but we can fit all the data, the size, the shape, diameter, everything into the manufacturing process. This lens is actually made 100% for you. Not for you and millions of other people across the globe that have similar prescription like you, glasses prescription. And I said, whatever you want to do, you let me know and I'm here for you. But if we don't present it to them, you will never know. And please, you know, if you have a patient that have 0.75 diopters of seal, you can't tell them it's too small. You won't appreciate it because you know they will. You would, I would. Yep. So I introduce it to everybody. Right, and and I I think that's a good philosophy, and I think it's a, a good a good place to end here. So so Dr. Schwartz, thank you so much for this today. These are really great cases, and um, we will have all of the stuff posted on OD Wire for everyone to watch the archive again this week. If you want to review the cases one more time, and if you have any questions, um, post all of your questions up there, and uh, we can go over it. So again, Dr. Schwartz, thank you, Corinne, thank you for being here as well, and thank you everyone for coming out tonight. And I, I look forward to seeing everybody online. So everybody have a good night. Adam. Absolutely. Always a pleasure. Thank you. Adam, say hi to your dad, please. He probably won't remember me, but that's okay. Oh, he remembers you, actually. I I, I saw him a couple days ago, and I said, hey, guess who I spoke with? Oh, no. <laughs> so he, he remembers all the people that he's tortured. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, regardless, please tell him I said hi. All right. All, all right. right. Thanks a lot, everyone. Thank much, guys. And I really appreciate uh, the time here, and um, hopefully uh, you guys found it interesting. Absolutely. Well, thanks so much. All right. Bye. All right. Have a good night.